folks, and welcome to Anatomy and Physiology on Demand. This is still week one, Wednesday. Um, so this will be a series of lectures which are going to be labeled 11B, 1, 2, 3, 4. And we are going to start tackling the nervous system again. Um, so just as a ref um, comment, if you need to go back and refresh what we've already learned about the nervous system, go back and do that. I hope you also realize that this week's lab, writing about the parts of the neuron, they're all there in an attempt to try to bring this back to the forefront of your thinking. So we talked previously about some nervous system functions and we're going to continue on talking about some more. Um, it's going to be really important and your body's maintaining its homeostasis. In fact, it's the nervous system with the endocrine system that are responsible for the homeostasis. Um, and as we all know, mental activity is a big one. And so at some point we will come back and we will talk about how you create memory, but that's probably one of uh, the last topics we'll discuss before um, the third test. Um, Lastly, we've talked a little bit about reflexes and we will talk some more about reflexes again. So um, we'll just build on some notions that we've already learned about. But for now, I want to go back to some basics we learned about um, the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. So if it's brain or spinal cord, it's central nervous system. And if it's a nerve, a ganglion or a sensory receptor, it's peripheral nervous system. And so let's focus on the peripheral nervous system for a minute. It can be divided to the sensory division. And as you recall, the other term for this would be afferent or the motor division or the efferent division. And so when we look at it functionally, the sensory division is what's taking the information towards the central nervous system. So we have these sensory receptors all throughout our body, not only in the skin, but also on some of our organs. And as we learned about, we have sensory receptors in our muscles and in our tendons, and they're transmitting the information towards the brain and the spinal cord. And this can be divided into two separate parts. The somatic sensory division is the part that's receiving the information from your skin, from your joints, from your muscles, from those tendons, from the special senses, as in like your eyes, your ears, your tongue, um, that we will talk about much later. And in contrast to the somatic sensory, that remember that word soma means body or flesh. And the contrast to that would be the word viscera, meaning organ. So the part that's receiving the sensory information from your viscera would be called the visceral sensory. So examples of this would include, for instance, that feeling of, I need to go to the bathroom. Okay. All right, so that's the afferent division and the efferent division taking information away from the central nervous system, then those neurons are going to synapse with the effectors. And as you recall, we have four different types of effectors, three of them being the three types of muscles and the fourth one being glands. And you, at first glance, you would think this would be divided up exactly the same as the sensory division, but in fact, it is not. Somatic motor, only applies to voluntary effectors. So only the part of the nervous system that's going to skeletal muscle will fall into the somatic motor, which means the neurons, which are going to glands, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle are not included here. They would be included in the involuntary portion, which is not known as visceral motor, but is known as the autonomic motor. I do want to point out, in case you've never heard this term before, it is not automatic. It's autonomic. So please learn this word. Okay. So getting back to basics, you should re hopefully remember this slide because we had it when we talked about tissues. We had it again when we talked about the neurons. So this is a picture of taken from within the central nervous system where we have neurons and we have those neuroglial cells. 
So we've spent a whole bunch of time talking about neurons, so I don't want to review that now, but I want to now talk about the neuroglial cells, all those other specialized cells. There are six different types of them, four which are only found in the central nervous system, and two which are only found outside of the central nervous system, so technically peripheral nervous system. So I'm going to go through these one at a time, and what you will notice at the top of um, each slide, I will be um, can't do that. Um, I will be having um, the prefix CNS or PNS apparent. Okay, so. As you see at the top, it says CNS neuroglial cell. So the first one we want to talk about is the astrocyte. And the reason why I talk about this one first is because it's the one that is the most abundant. And if you look at the picture on the top right, as well as the light microscope photomicrograph at the bottom right, what you can see at first glance is these look like stars. Your sea stars, what we commonly call sea fish, I mean, um, starfish. Um, this is what they look like. They have a lot of processes. And as you can tell from the drawing at the top, these processes like to attach to blood vessels. And they actually will regulate the blood flow to that local area of the brain by causing that blood vessel to constrict or vasodilate. It has those little processes at the end. Um, which are attached to the blood vessel, which you can see um, in the circle where it says end foot co covers blood vessel. And this is what's controlling what's going on in this blood vessel. Now, between the capillary and these foot processes of the astrocytes, this forms what we call the blood-brain barrier. So the blood-brain barrier seen in the drawing on the top left. Here we have the endothelial cell of the capillary, and there are tight junctions between the cells, which prevent any fluid, even water, any ions from exiting from the blood to get into the brain. Okay. And so what has to happen is things have to pass through the blood vessel wall and into the astrocyte in order to get into the blood. And this is what prevents like most of our drugs from having an effect in the nervous system. Now, there are some things that are very easy to pass through phospholipid bilayers, as you might expect. And that would include oxygen, carbon dioxide, also alcohol. This is why you get drunk so quickly. Nicotine, sugars, and some of our amino acids whereas other things will never be able to pass on their own, such as any large proteins, potassium, and most of our drugs. So here's another way of looking at it, where instead of doing a cross section, we're looking at a longitudinal section where you can see the blood vessel on the left with its endothelial cells. We have all the tight junctions between the cells. We also have tight junctions um, next to the astrocytes and the endothelial cells themselves. And so basically the astrocytes are controlling what is going to appear in the interstitial fluid. In other words, they're controlling what's going to be affecting the neurons in that area locally. Okay. Now, there are more functions to the astrocytes besides forming the super important blood-brain barrier. Basically, they form a framework for one specific area. 
in here, the astrocyte is important for converting blood glucose levels to lactate. And this is actually how the neuron receives its nourishment. Although in this course, we're probably just gonna stick with the word glucose is the important source of energy. Technically, it is lactate and not glucose. Um, it also influences the signaling between neurons because it helps control potassium levels as well as neurotransmitter release. So it does have a very important role. In other words, without the astrocyte, the neurons would not be able to function. Okay. Now, if you have an area of injury in the brain, the astrocytes proliferate and they produce material which ends up forming a local scar. That part of the brain becomes very dense compared to others. And generally, this is a protective mechanism. It prevents neuron messages from going to this area. Um, this is important. Like, for instance, um, you could, if, if the neurons in this area, which were damaged, could receive impulses, they could, for instance, trigger seizure activity. And so this sclerosis or astrocytosis after injury prevents this from happening. The second cell type in the central nervous system is known as the oligodendrocyte. Oligo is a prefix that means you. So this is a cell that has few processes. The particular drawing there only shows three of them, but in reality, I want you to realize there are more than three. It has been simplified for the drawing picture. And what these processes do is they then wrap around parts of axons of nearby neurons, okay? And so one oligodendrocyte will do this to multiple axons in the central nervous system. And it's the process of all of these oligodendrocytes wrapping around the axons that is going to form the myelin sheath within the central nervous system. Now, remember here, I said, there are four central nervous system neuroglial cells and two peripheral nervous system neuroglial cells which means myelination in the peripheral nervous system will not be due to the oligodendrocyte. The third cell, that's a neuroglial cell in the central nervous system is called a microglial cell or microglia, okay? Microglia, meaning small cell. And if you look at this one, that cell body area is very tiny. And this one, is looking around trying to figure out is everything going okay and it kind of migrates to trouble air so think of it as a Roomba vacuum cleaner um, having a similar function like the Langerhan cells when we talked about in the skin um, it comes from the same precursor cell that our white blood cells come from and that enables it to become a macrophage and perform immune functions if that is what is needed in the brain. And they will congregate at this site of injury and they will form this process which will trigger a localized inflammatory process. And the fourth and final cells are called ependymal cells. And if you look at this drawing, what you can see, they're, they're all lined up right next to each other with no extracellular fluid or matrix or anything. So they very much resemble a simple cuboidal or, or maybe a, you know, that type of epithelium, but there's no basement membrane. They have these little processes that look like roots, which are going down into the nervous tissue deep to them. And so what these do is they actually form an epithelial-like function, they line all the surfaces. So they're going to line the external surface of the brain, external to something called the pia mater on both the brain and the spinal cord, which we will learn about later in this lecture on a subsequent video. And they're also going to be lining spaces within the brain and spinal cord, things that we call the ventricles and the central canal, which will also be covered on a later video. Now, in certain areas, what we will see is an outpouch and kind of a fluffiness where these ependymo cells are going around and surrounding capillaries and they're sticking into these ventricular spaces and the brain. 
And this is a structure known as the choroid plexus. And this structure, which we'll talk about again later, is where the fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid is made. Now, because this is where the fluid is made that goes into these ventricles, we have to have a mechanism for that fluid to move around. And the mechanism is the fact that on the apical surface of these cells, there are very long cilia. And those long cilia are what's going to circulate the fluid from one ventricle to the next ventricle through various canals and structures we'll learn about. And eventually that fluid which came from the bloodstream in this capillary bed will be returned back into the bloodstream. All right, on to the peripheral nervous system now. The first of two cells is what is called a satellite cell. And the satellite cell is a very interesting cell. It is found surrounding the cell bodies of neurons in the peripheral nervous system. Um, and so cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system are only located in these structures known as ganglia. So at each ganglion is where you would find these satellite cells. We used to think they had a certain, strong, a certain well delineated function, but now we know that's no longer true. But what we do know is that somehow they are regulating the environment, environment and how it affects the cell body, the soma of the neuron. If the satellite cells are not there, the neurons will die. Now, interestingly, we have found in the embryo, these satellite cells can morph into other types of neuroglial cells, but that ability is lost in the adult. If you look at the bottom right picture, what you see right in the middle, that central cell, that's the nucleolus and the nucleus. And then we have the cell body of the neuron. And then you can see all the little cells surrounding on the periphery. And each of those would be a satellite cell with its nucleus. And the last and final cell, and the cell that we will talk more about than any other cell in the neuroglial sense is a Schwann cell. And it is the Schwann cell that is important for forming the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. And this is done different. Remember in the central nervous system, we had the oligodendrocyte and it had processes that wrapped around. In the peripheral nervous system, what is going to happen, the entire Schwann cell is going to surround the axon. At first, it looks like a hot dog bun with the axon being the hot dog in the middle of it. And then it starts wrapping itself around and around and around. And so the entire cell forms a tiny portion of the myelin sheath. Okay. And in fact, this wrapping goes on somewhere between 50 and 100 times for each cell. And it's tightly wrapped, so when you look at it, almost all of it is going to be plasma membrane with only tiny amounts of cytosol. This outermost thicker layer, this is where we're gonna find the nucleus and other organelles. And so this outer thicker area is what is called the neural lemma, which really isn't a word I'm gonna be talking about too much, but I just wanted you to understand what that word is since it does appear in your textbook. All right, so. To compare the two, the myelin sheath in the central nervous system, one oligodendrocyte sends its processes and it can form parts of the myelin sheath on up to 60 different axons. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, each individual swan cell wraps itself around the axon and can form up to one millimeter of myelin on one axon. So the upper picture is like microscope picture with purple tagging lipid. And so if you recall, I talked previously about how the myelin sheath was like 80% lipid and 20% protein. So it's this very fatty coating surrounding the axon inside of it. And on the bottom, you have the transmission electron microscope picture where you can see the axon with a cytoplasm, which is labeled axoplasm. And if you look at around 11 o'clock on that picture, you can see all the little layers of the myelin um, sheath. In other words, all the layers of the Schwann cell wrapping itself again and again and again and again and again with the huge nucleus smushed out 
between the 12 and three o'clock. So that's what happens for myelinated axons, but not all axons are myelinated. We have unmyelinated axons both in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. So in the peripheral nervous system, what we have is we have Schwann cells that have these foldings, okay? So that olive colored cell on the left, that is a Schwann cell. And there's all the axons next to it. And what happens is the Schwann cell makes these foldings. So like little dimples, um, which go around each axon, but it's not wrapping around it in multiple layers. So technically, yes, there is the same cell around the axon, but we're not showing 50 to 100 layers of this lipid dense material surrounding them. And so almost all axons that are unmyelinated will have their own channel with surrounded by part of a Schwann cell. If the axons are very, very tiny, they may share a channel. So here is a slide where you can compare a myelinated versus an unmyelinated axon. So on the top left and the top left are examples of two axons that are myelinated. And then in the middle with all the brown things surrounding it, those are examples of unmyelinated axons. So I suggest you pause it here and then look at this and make sure you understand it before continuing. Okay, so if you understand that, let's talk about myelination for a second. And to refresh your memory, myelin is formed by those plasma membranes of the neuroglial cells, whether they are oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system or Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. And this is 80% lipid and 20% protein. This myelination starts in the second trimester of pregnancy. However, as you can see, looking at the picture of the little kid, there's not that much. In fact, almost all of it is postnatal. The first two years of life are the most significant time for myelination, but this process is not fully finished until well into adolescence. And this is what gives us some of the plasticity of the brain in the young, um, the teenager and the children's ages. Um, remembering that this myelin is 80% lipid should help you to understand why the American Academy of Pediatrics says that it is super important not to give children at least in their first year of life, if not further along in their childhood, do not give them skim milk, low fat milk, or any of those things. These babies and children need the fat in their diet in order to have the lipid to form their myelin sheath. Now, stop for a second and look at this picture before I continue. Is that a picture of a neuron in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system? And how do you know? Okay, so hopefully by now you have figured out the answer to that. Whether it's the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system, this structure is going to uh, exist in both. However, I'm not showing pictures in both. I'm just showing this typical picture. Between, and obviously this is peripheral nervous system because these are Schwann cells completely wrapping around the axon. Between these Schwann cells or alternatively between the wrappings of oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, we have little spaces where the axon is exposed. And each one of these is called a node of Ranvier. Um, if you listen to Dr. Shopee's um, lab talk, he pronounces it different, but this is actually a French dude's name and it actually is pronounced node of Ranvier. Instead of, I don't remember how he pronounced it, but I know he didn't pronounce it that way. 
And so you can see in the photo micrograph on the bottom right where the arrow is, there's a clear node in the top one. And if you look at the second one, you also can see a clear node as well. Um, once again, that is a stain where the purple is for the lipid, which makes the, um, the myelination evident. In the drawing on the bottom left, you can see all the wrapping around and around and around of multiple layers of the Schwann cells with the node of Rangier clearly exposed between adjacent ones. So notice to the left, we do have the cell body, the axon hillock, a little bit of the axon showing, and then we're only going to see axon between all the various Schwann cells until we get all the way down towards the axon terminal and the terminal bouton. So what is interesting as far as neurons, the size of the axon does matter. The larger the diameter of the axon, the more rapid the impulse is going to be. And so I have pictures on the bottom left of four different ones. You don't have to know if they're A, alphas, betas, deltas, or if they're Cs. Um, so don't bother looking at that. I just wanted you to see the differences in speeds and the diameter there. Um, the one on the far right is a naked one. And as you can see, the speed is up to two meters per second. Where the next one over is the same size, but myelinated, the speed has increased. And then the two on the left, the axon is obviously larger in size and the speed is tremendously fast in comparison. Now, since we're not metric here in the United States, I put the table on the bottom right, which kind of converts everything into miles an hour and compares the speed of those various nerve fibers to common activities such as walking or biking or being a bird or an airplane. So you don't have to memorize these numbers. I just want you to understand the concept. All right, last two topics, because we've talked about the neuron previously and all the various parts of it. Gray matter, okay. So gray matter is where we find the neuron cell bodies, the dendrites with the incoming messages, and our neuroglial cells. And so the gray matter in the brain is everything on the surface of the cerebrum and cerebellum, what we would call cerebral cortex or, or cerebellar cortex. And then deep within the cerebrum, we have these air, very, very deep, we have these areas known as nuclei. And the spinal cord, if you, on the top right, if you look, that butterfly shaped thing in the middle or a shaped thing in the middle that's the gray area so the parts that are gray are then things called horns and this is all terminology from this week's lab so if you don't get it right now it's covered in more detail in lab this week and outside the brain and spinal cord it would be in a structure in the peripheral nervous system and the only structures in the peripheral nervous system that contain neuron cell bodies are the ganglia. And so there's an example of a ganglion in the top right corner, just outside the spinal cord. Now, gray matter is in contrast to white matter. So knowing that the cell bodies and the dendrites and the neuroglial cells are basically the gray matter, what does that leave us with? for white matters, it leaves us the axons. So in the brain, on the left, the white matter is always deep to the surface. So it's deep to the cerebral cortex or the cerebellar cortex. On the top right, the white matter is superficial. When we have these groups of axons traveling within the central nervous system, for instance, traveling through various parts of the brain or traveling through the spinal cord, we would call a group of axons traveling together a tract. So it would be like a highway of axons going in one direction. Okay. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, this group of axons traveling together, we call a nerve. So take this moment and compare white and gray matter 
on the transverse section of a brain and transverse section of the sp spinal cord, figuring out what parts are gray, what parts are white, where are the cell bodies, where are the neuroglial cells, where are the axons. And when you're done with that, uh, we are done with this particular recording. So thanks again for all your work and um, we will come back soon.